good to see each one of you this morning. Amen. I appreciate you being here. You could have chosen to be anywhere else, but you chose to be with us, and I thank you. Amen. If you have your Bible, you can be turning to Mark chapter 14. You can hold your finger there and find Luke chapter 22. That's where we'll be preaching uh, kind of mirror images of each other. Because whenever you start looking through the Gospels, remember you're looking at uh, four different men's testimonies. Amen. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about fellowship and foot washing and of course you know it, whether you know it or not if you've been around on Sunday mornings you know I've been preaching the life of Jesus in chronological order for going on six years. I'll tell y'all how smart I am when I approached it I said man I'm going to start preaching the life of Jesus around Thanksgiving. 2014, and I thought to myself, I can do this in about six months, man. I can hammer down, huh? Yeah. No, if if we continue until November, it'll be six years since we've been preaching the life of Jesus, and that's a good chance you say Amen. Yeah. Um, as best we can, anyway. So today, as we approach this, I want you to keep in mind that as we preach the life of Jesus, often we find ourselves, or I find myself, in a mini mini series. So you can take today as a as an introduction to a mini series called Fellowship and Foot Washing. See, because what has happened is, is we have now entered into the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry. He has been spending time with the public. He has taken time to get to, to explain what the end times are going to look like. And it's, it's it's quite sobering when we look around and understand that when Jesus talks about the end times, how how the days would be like the days of Noah. And you look back at what the days of Noah were, we look around and shake our heads and say, Come, Lord Jesus. But he is also now, he has moved away out of the public light, and he is now going to take time and focus his attention on his followers. So today I'm going to tell you it is no exaggeration to say that the life of Jesus is full of supernatural events. Right? I, see, me, when I say that, I automatically start thinking of all the miraculous that happened around Jesus' life. I'm talking about from his birth all the way through his earthly ministry. We think of angels, healings, deliverance. We see the multiplication of food. We, we see how death even was subject unto Jesus. But often, often I'm afraid that, that we as believers are looking for that dramatic supernatural event. We're looking for the halo wearing angel to come down sword drawn and, and then all of a sudden we could say we had this great overwhelming experience with God. And you may. You may do like Jacob. You may have that, that Jacob's ladder experience. You may find yourself in the desert of life, you and no one else, and all of a sudden you will encounter God. That would be a great thing, an awesome thing. Maybe, maybe you are going to be like the Apostle Paul and have the dramatic experience on the road to Damascus where, where the Lord himself comes down and knocks you off your horse and blinds you just for a little while to help humble you so that you can see him, blinds you to the world so you can look to him. <coughs> right? We, we often find ourselves looking for these what we think of as large miracles. Do you understand there's no such thing as a small miracle? Amen. Uh, I don't want that to go over your head, but there's no such thing as a small miracle because we can't do miracles. So any miraculous event has to be of God, so anything with God is not small. So Jesus, of course, is the fulfillment of, and his life is the fulfillment of Psalm 37, 23 that says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his ways. You see, that is where I long to live. I hope that is where you long to live, that your steps will be ordered by the Lord. See, Jesus walked in this calm assurance that everything that happened to him, everything that happened through him, everything that happened by him or of his Father in heaven. Jesus had this assurance that, that we need. Jesus knew that it happened either directly by God or was allowed, uh, was allowed by his Father. 
You see, everything that happened in Jesus' life was to the purpose of fulfilling God's holy calling in his life. You see, Jesus did not encounter anybody accidentally. Every encounter was quite literally a divine appointment. Some of you have heard me say on more than one occasion, speaking to you and about others, that I, I know for a fact there are people in my life that are divine appointments. Amen. Not just to meet them for a while, but they are in my life for a purpose. And God knows what it is and continues to use them as an encouragement to stay the course. You see, Jesus was able as a man. Remember, Jesus was a man. He, he was fully God and fully man, but he, he was able to walk this way because he knew who was in control. In Isaiah 46, 9 through 11, it says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God. And there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do my pleasure. Yea, I have spoken it. It will also, I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. You see, Jesus would have known the scripture. He could trust his father that anything that he has spoken, he will surely do it. You see, on Sunday nights, we're, we're, we're in a series of the promises of God. Let me tell you something about the promises of God. They will give you the confidence and the faith to walk through hell with a water pistol if that's what you need to do. Amen. Huh? I mean, the Apostle Paul said on more than one occasion, there are three words that will carry you through this life, and that is, I am persuaded. I am persuaded that he is able. I am persuaded that he is good. I am persuaded that he is faithful to accomplish what he set out to do. I can live with that, and so can you. So, so as, as we are actually seeing what we would call the Passion Week unfold in our studies, we see Jesus walking out some principles that I will say could and should give us hope. You see, be, be sure God is in control. See, my, probably one of my favorite verses among the thousands of other favorite verses is Romans chapter 8, 28. For we know all things work together for good to those that love God and are the called according to his purpose. God doesn't promise that everything will be good. He promises to take everything in your life and turn it to good. He is the only person that can turn ashes in the beauty. Huh? In Proverbs 19, 21, it says, There are many devices in man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. God said it, that settles it. So, Jesus, in his last moments today, as we will look, does not waste anything. Even and especially time. Now, I'm going to have to admit to you, this will, this will shock some of you, considering that I've been in construction longer than I haven't been. But I have a pet peeve, and it's not just a couple of things, but it is wasting anything, but especially wasting time. Often, as we, we find ourselves in circumstances, what happens to us? So we begin to perceive that, that we are either wasting time or we have wasted our time. What does go, I mean, does it not put ants on you to spend your time doing something and then it's not appreciated or not wanted and you find yourself going, well, Lord, I have done nothing but waste my time. That don't put ants on y'all. Well, let me just go ahead and stop and say this message today is not for any of y'all. Y'all are all perfect, sanctified, holy saints. This will be for the people that will hear in the days to come. I'm preaching to the choir, so everybody say amen. amen. You see, because I can tell you now from experience, when I was younger, I had a man that I had a lot of faith and a lot of confidence in and believed what he said, and I can tell you in the moment when things went to hell in a handbasket, it seemed as though when one of my worst 
thoughts. The reason that caused me to hate certain parts was that it seemed like I had done nothing but waste my time. I could have been going to college. I could have been doing a whole lot of other things, but instead I was staying the course, and then when everything went down, I have wasted my time. See, I said, none of you, none of y'all can relate. I understand. You see, I can also tell you that, that I have worked for a particular company, worked there a long time, invested lots of me, lots of my hours. I invested what little knowledge I do have, my abilities, the little that I have, any talent. I didn't hold anything back. When I had way too much confidence in what they would or would not do, I had higher hopes for them. And of course, then when, when things changed, I found myself looking around going, man, I have just wasted wasted all this time. You know, I started thinking to myself, after all the hours, see, I have lost days. I mean, just, I have days I have no memory of. See, y'all don't know how, how blessed I am to have Tina. This was before Alex was born. I had to go on a job where when I tell you we work around the clock, I mean, we work around the clock. We went in before daylight. We would come in at night, pour concrete. I'd go home, take a bath, get a nap, and go right back to work. I'm talking about I have very foggy memories, but it was weird. Then and Camilla would get up in the middle of the night and pretend to have supper with me because we were a family. That kind of stuff carries you through. But out of that, though, I, I, I remember, and of course, if you get to dwelling on it, you start thinking about those hours and lost days, and of course, you know, the money gets spent. And, and I find myself with nothing but experience and memories. You see, I, I often joke with the people at work that I don't work to make money anymore. I don't work to make a living. I work to make memories. Because at the end of the day, that's all that's ever left. Amen. After you pay the bills, after you finish this job and Go to the next one. All you have is memories. But now let me go ahead and tell you, please, I want everyone in here to not hear me as a cynic, as though, you know, because I am a bit cynical at times, but I want you to look past the cynicism. I want you to look at the things uh, from and through the perspective that God is in control and that he has not been taken by surprise you see, he has kept us and has and is using those wasted time moments to educate us, to humble us, and to prepare us for what's to come. You see, at the end of the day, if all we have left is memories, rejoice. Because that's your testimony. Mercy, I am preaching better than y'all are amen in this morning. Huh? If all you have is left is memories, praise God, because that is your testimony. You see, so what we're going to be looking at is, is that we are going to move in and begin talking about what is often called the Last Supper. And, and I'm going to tell you that I believe Jesus is doing something very simple. And, and I will tell you that it is unperceived by most. But what he is doing is he is helping his disciples make lasting memories that will become their testimony. I want you to just think about something. Do you realize that the Lord puts up firewalls in our lives if we pay attention? I mean, just, I want you to just pick a disciple that you think you might want to be or identify with or pick one that nobody talks about. I think I'm going to be Bartholomew today. They don't really talk about him that much, so we'll, we'll give him a little limelight. Can you imagine being Bartholomew and the Lord called you and you followed him for three and a half years? He told you from the beginning it's going to be rough. He said it's not going to be easy. People are going to hate you because you love me. They're going to hate you for my name's sake. They're just going to, they're going to hate you, Bartholomew. But in your mind, you have decided that you know that this is the Messiah. And if he dies tomorrow, he's coming back the next day. And everything's going to be fine. He is going to rule this world. I'm going to be with him. Glory to God. 
Can you imagine how disenfranchised you might become, though, when the one that you followed for three and a half years is crucified and from your perspective does nothing? Now, I can go ahead and tell you from a, from a man's perspective, I would be thinking to myself, I have wasted three and a half years. But, but, keep in mind, the Lord does everything with a purpose. So before he goes to the cross, he is going to do something that is extremely supernatural. It is miraculous, and most of y'all don't even know how miraculous it is. In Mark chapter 14, it's it, uh, uh, y'all like that big long introduction? This whole thing's an introduction today. Mark chapter 14 and verse 12, it says, And the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, his disciples said unto him, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare that thou mayest eat the Passover? And he sendeth forth two of his disciples, and saith unto them, Go ye into the city, and there shall and there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wheresoever he shall go in, say ye to the good of the house, The master saith, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared, there made ready for us. And his disciples went forth, came into the city, and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover, and in the evening he cometh with the twelve. See, I'm going to tell you right now, from the very beginning, even the Last Supper is marked by the supernatural. What are you talking about? Well, it's almost like a ghost. The, the Lord tells them something. He says, look, just go into town. And you're going to run across a certain man. Doesn't give us a name. Anything. You're going to just, quote unquote, happen upon a man. Just coincidentally, you're going to happen upon a man. Now, there is no coincidence. This is a supernatural event in the most common of things. You see, Jesus it, it has a need. Okay, he needs a place to go and eat the Passover. And what I want you to understand is that God used a tradition that had gone on for generation after generation to make ready a place for his son to eat the Passover. That is an awesome thing. God had been allowing these people to do the same thing every year over and over again so that when it was time for Jesus to eat the Passover, they would be a place ready for him. What are you talking about, man? Well, look, observant Jews, zealous Jews who were anxiously awaiting the Messiah. Remember, there were groups of people who weren't looking for Jesus just like Christians today. They'll tell you they don't believe in a millennial. They don't believe that Jesus is coming back. They believe that we have got to prepare this earth and make it as good as we can because this is all there is. They're wrong, but that's, that's what they believe. And there were Jews in Jesus' day who didn't believe a Messiah was coming. They believed that it was all just spiritual. But those who believed the word as it was written were anticipating the coming of a Savior. They were anticipating. They were anxious to see their Messiah come. So what they would do is there were many who lived in Jerusalem there that would go every year and set a table for the Messiah. Amen. Year after year after year. They would prepare their hearts, prepare their minds, and prepare a place for the Messiah to come, hoping, just, just hoping above hope that the Messiah would choose them to come and eat with them. And why would he? Because they had made ready for his coming. It automatically makes me think of Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold. I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Jesus is surely saying to us today, we need to prepare a place that he can come in and sup with us. 
Can I give you an aside right off the bat? Now look, this is just a, a rabbit trail. But look, we can learn something uh, very important from the homeowner. Number one, he had prepared to meet his Messiah. Okay, he had made preparation to meet the Messiah. He wanted to meet God's anointed, whom he had never seen. Remember in John 20, 29, Jesus speaking, you know, Thomas is, you know, no doubting Thomas. I ain't going to believe unless I see him. I'm not going to believe unless I touch him, unless I put my hand on his side and my finger in the nail prints. I ain't believing nothing. I've been duped one time. It ain't going to happen again. About that time, Jesus shows up in the room and says, Here, Thomas, feel me, son. Thrust your hand in my side. Feel the nail prints in my hand. He says, My Lord and my God. And Jesus pronounces a blessing over me and over you today. What are you talking about? He says, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. He has pronounced a blessing over any that will believe without having to see. So he had prepared his house for a Messiah that he had never seen, and he prepared his house year in and year out. But this is where we ought to learn something from, and that is that we ought, this is an altar of life, we ought to prepare our houses, our bodies, our minds, our hearts to meet Jesus, whom we've never seen. The book of Revelation gives us the best description of Jesus Christ. When people say that, you know, the Bible never gives us a description of the Lord, we can't know what he looks like. I can tell you exactly what he looks like. He's got eyes like fire, feet like brass. Huh? John said, come up higher, didn't he? I mean, it's a pretty, it's pretty simple, man. He's got long, white, flowing hair. He's got a name written on his thigh that says King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is on, he is totally recognizable to those who are looking for him. So what we need to do is pay attention to this homeowner and prepare our houses, our minds, our hearts to meet Jesus. We need to purge out the junk. This is one of the hardest things in the world. I know it is. But, but you, you, you have got to intentionally get rid of some junk in your life. Too many Christians that I know are bound up in chains. They are bound up in the, these things. So Hebrews 12 says, let us lay aside every weight and sin that does so easily beset us. So you see, back, back, I used to be fatter than I am now, but there was a time when I lost 100 pounds, over 110 pounds in about a year. Let me tell you what I learned. One of the first things I learned was that over 300 pounds, a 20-minute walk is an excellent workout. Just say it, you'll sweat. But let me tell you what happens. After you lose about 50 or 60 pounds, 20-minute walk ain't nothing. You can almost jog if you, you know, want to run from something that's not there. So what happens is, is if you want to continue to challenge yourself, you would do like I would do dumb, and, and that is I would pick up some weights and carry them while I walked. And look, with my grip gave out, I got me a backpack and filled it full of weights. You know what that did? It slowed me down. It made me work harder. It made me struggle. But if I wanted things to be easier, all I had to do was take the weight off. That's a natural situation that has a very heavy spiritual application. Many of us, many in the church world today, are carrying a load that we don't need to be carrying. It's not, first of all, it's not ours to carry. It is slowing down our spiritual growth. It is slowing down and impeding our relationship with Jesus Christ. And what we need to do is we, begin, we need to start unpacking some of the junk, man. I'll just go ahead. These are, this is not a comprehensive list. I'm just going to tell you that I, I have been around enough people to know there are way too many Christians out there that need to get rid of all the unforgiveness in their heart. They have more unforgiveness than they'll admit. And you know how you know it? When you bring up a particular subject or a particular person and they'll tell you everything they ever did wrong. Detail it for you. That's unforgiveness. 
And unforgiveness leads to another thing that we should never have in our life, and that is bitterness. We should never lead a life. Bitterness will kill you, man. Bitterness will eat you up from the inside like drinking acid, man. We should never be going around with wrath and hate in our hearts. You see, what we need to do is empty our hearts and minds of all the junk. You've got to do it intentionally also. But you have to prepare yourself to receive him. You know, it, it kind of goes around in the memes on Facebook often, but you listen to me. You cannot love, hate your brother. You cannot hate your brother and live like hell, harbor unforgiveness in your heart, and truly worship God freely. You may go try to worship, but it won't be nothing but, but false. It'll, it'll be full of air. That's all it'll be. And the reason is, is because we, we know that when we harbor these things in our heart, we're grieving. The Spirit of God. First Peter. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to read it to you. First Peter chapter 1. Or chapter 2 says. Wherefore laying aside all malice. And all guile. And hypocrisies. And envies. And all evil speakings. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. That ye may grow thereby. If so. Be that ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. To whom, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed in need of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus. We are to prepare ourselves so that Jesus might come and be with us. Amen. See, Jesus is going to have the Last Supper with his disciples so that he might have fellowship with them. Amen. But if the room would have been full of junk, there wouldn't have been room for the disciples and there wouldn't have been room for Jesus. And I'm going to tell you right now, you need to get rid of the junk today so that there is room for Jesus to come in and fellowship with you. It's not really a hard word, it's just the truth. Another aside this morning, uh, we call this aside number two, or you can call it an observation. But the disciples experienced this supernatural event, as small as it seems, because they were obedient to the word. <coughs> they were obedient to the command. They were obedient to the direction that Jesus gave them. If you'd like. Let me tell you something. The grace of God should develop in you a desire for obedience. Y'all know I don't like to share from my own life, but I did have a conversation the other day. We're going to talk about it here in a minute. About a, a, you know, with a young man, and he, he, he just, it's sincerely, he said, man, he says, my wife believes this, and I believe that. And, you know, he says, you know, I, I, I just don't think you can know you're saved. He said, yeah, he said, but he said, so I know you're a preacher now. I said, so tell me, how can I know that I'm saved? So I'm glad you asked. I love hard questions. I love ones that I really can't explain. I said, but I'll just bring it down to an earthly level if you'd like. This is, this is my best one right here, the only way I can tell you. Is y'all remember that time I was on the way to church? It's been a long time ago. I was on my way to church and I had a flat. It's always the driver's side front, you know, because I couldn't get all the way off the road. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And lot roads like a drag strip. So I'm out there changing the tire. I get the, I get the spare on, man. I go to get that last lug nut. The lug nut falls off, runs out in the middle of the road. I go to get it, and I get hit by a dump truck. I still made it to church on time. Now, look, you're going to look at me and go, you are lying. Right. Here's the thing. I, I can tell you that you can know you're saved because if you get hit by the dump truck of the salvation that comes by encountering Jesus Christ, you will be changed. Amen. Yes. See, if I told you I got run over by a dump truck and walked in here with no stitches, no bumps or bruises, you would say I was lying. If you tell me you met the same Jesus I met and hadn't been changed, you're lying. Huh? Yes. Hey, yeah. Mm. Yes. Anyway, I'm just telling you. And so what I'm telling you is, is that when you get a hold to the, to the Word of God and begin to be obedient to it, you will experience what these men experience. You see, the 
this statement that I've just made presumes that we're listening to Jesus. See, they had a desire to hear Jesus. The disciples had a desire to know what Jesus wanted. They wanted to, they, they had this, this desire to know what Jesus expected so they could be obedient. I mean, isn't that the way a disciple is supposed to look? He goes to his master for directions. He doesn't go to the master for suggestions. You see, we, we have misunderstood the master subject of dynamic. When you go to the master, the name implies that he is Lord of all. When you go to him, you're going to him for direction, not suggestion. Everybody got that? So now, in a coincidental way, wait, 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 no coincidence. In a, in a conversation this week about an unrelated topic, about being knowing your salvation and all, and I was responding to another question about the Holy Spirit. I found myself saying something that I don't recall ever saying before. Because I have come to the conclusion that God has not called us to be successful. He's called us to be faithful. I have come to the conclusion that when we start trying to measure ourselves by other people and other people's standards to, to call it success, what we're doing is we're envying and we're sinning against God. So rather than trying to be quote unquote successful, maybe we should just focus on being faithful. But out of my mouth came something that I had never said. As far as I know, I've never said it before. Because every question he asked me, I always lead him the same way, which is back to the Word of God. And he, he says, well, I said, look, man. I said, I would truly consider my ministry, if I had a ministry, it's, it's, it's the Lord. I would consider it successful if the people that I minister to are directed to, led by, and get in the Word of God. If nothing else happens when I preach, if nothing else happens when I pray, if nothing else happens when I see, if they turn to the Word of God, I would consider that successful. Why would I say that? Well, first of all, that was prompted by the Spirit of God, but I would also say this. For everyone that can hear me today, the Bible has the answer. The Bible, word, the, the word of God, God breathed word has the answer for every question, every need, every problem that you could run across. It's either going to come by way of command to do something, it's going to come by way of prohibition to avoid something, or it's going to come by way of principle. So the thing is, the condensed version of my pat answer to people when they bring me quote unquote problems is, is that Jesus said if we had faith, he said if we had faith as a mustard seed, but if we had faith, if we could say to the mountain and it would go, say to the sycamine tree and it would jump. He also said that nothing is impossible to those who believe. Belief is faith, right? So the, the key here is that Jesus said that we must live by faith. And Paul said, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So just to, just to condense it down for you, to distill it down to the lowest common denominator is, and I don't want to oversimplify, but getting this word in you. Is how you're going to get faith. Paul said faith comes by hearing by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And Jesus said if you want to live a victorious life, you're going to do it by faith. Amen. So what I'm telling you is, is that you need to get the word in you. You need to know the word. And you're going to have to put it to work and apply it to your life. See, most of us can't say we hear from Jesus because we don't hear his word. So last for today, that means I'm closing. The purpose of the meal coming up that Jesus is preparing for
was to honor God. It was to honor God's command to keep the Passover. Y'all remember what the Passover meal is? It is a remembrance. It is a memorial of what God did for the children of Israel in Egypt. When the tenth plague is coming, it says, look, the firstborn of all, everybody, everyone in Egypt is going to die. It's, there's not a house that it's not going to touch. And the only stopgap measure that you will have to do what I say. Take a lamb. You're going to kill the lamb. You're going to capture the blood. You're going to take hyssop and you're going to strike the doorpost and the header of the door. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over. You see, the only thing today stopping the death angel for most of us is the blood of Jesus. When I see the blood, I'll pass it. Jesus is going there to memorialize what he is fixing to do on the cross. The Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. He is going there to fellowship with his brethren. He's going there to relive, as it were, Exodus chapter 12. Jesus is spending time with his disciples, not wasting it. He is in the last moments, the last hours of his life. And what is he doing? He is spending time with his disciples, fellowshipping with them, being with them, pouring into them, preparing them, giving them a memory that when the time comes, they can testify to what they were doing on that last night. You see, Jesus wanted fellowship with his disciples. He sat down with them as what the word says. There was no pomp, no circumstances, no, no lighting, no light show, no strobe light, huh? no smoke machine, no canned music. Just Jesus and his men. And I can tell you today, you know what Jesus long for today above anything else that he might have fellowship with us. It doesn't have to be in a church building. It can be in the comfort of your own home, the front seat of your car. Jesus desires to have fellowship with you. And see in 1 Corinthians 1 9 it says God is faithful whom you were called into the fellowship of his son Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 John 3 1 says that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son Jesus Christ you see as we talk about fellowship and foot washing Jesus wants to spend time with His people not waste it we stand this morning open altar this morning. If you would like to come pray, you can. Won't nobody bother you. And if you don't want to come down here and pray, you pray right where you are, because I'm going to pray with us. But Jesus is longing to have fellowship with each and every one of you. I'm so thankful that he is willing to meet me early in the morning. I'm so thankful he is willing to meet me at any time, any place when I make a place ready for him. Let's pray this morning. Father, I thank you today. Lord, I just thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for your kindness. And I thank you for every soul that has come here today. Lord, I do pray that you would touch their hearts and minds. I pray that you would extend your hand of grace and mercy to each one. Lord, let us find comfort in you. Let us find fellowship with you. Lord, and I pray that you would be with us. Lord, help us to be all that you have called us to be in Jesus' name.